Hello and welcome to Talking Points. I'm Dave Kelly, Director of Advanced Media Production at Cal State Long Beach. Today we'll be talking about oil and alternative energy. Our discussion will cover the strategies for sustainable energy development in the future. I'm joined today by two professors from the College of Engineering. They are Dr. Jalal Tarabzadeh and Dr. Hamid Rahai. Welcome, gentlemen, and thank you both for joining us on Talking Points. Thank you. Thank you for inviting us and uh, for the opportunity to be on the Talking Point. Absolutely. Let's talk about oil to begin with. Oil has been part of our energy landscape, a major part of it, for the last hundred years. And about 10 or 15 years ago, there was a lot of talk about diminishing returns with oil. And uh, one of the terms that was used at that time was peak oil. And a lot of people expressed fear that we wouldn't be able to transition to alternative energy in time to sustain the economy and so forth. But today we're actually seeing a revival in oil production, particularly in U.S. oil production. We're up 44 percent from where we were in 2005. Recent statistics show that we're producing about 8 million barrels of oil per day in the United States, which represents about 10 percent of overall worldwide production. One of the reasons why we're having this revival is because of the technologies that have advanced over the last 10 years, uh, namely hydraulic fracturing, which is also referred to as fracking, and horizontal drilling. And because of that, we're now producing about three and a quarter million of those barrels a day, uh, direct, directly attributable to fracking. So Jalal, I'm gonna start with you. What does this mean about our energy future? Are we off the hook, and should we just rely on oil from now on? Uh, we will be depending on oil for the foreseeable p future, although there are efforts in the direction to be become more independent of uh, fossil fuels. It's not going to happen quickly. It uh, took 100 years to get to this point. Uh, we are addicted to that. We are trying to change the culture. We are trying to be more efficient in use of the energy sources. but. Uh, what I see, uh, the dependency on uh, fossil fuel and specifically oil and gas, natural gas, uh, would be here for uh, foreseeable future. And uh, Hamid, I wanted to ask you about the regulatory environment and the environmental concerns about fracking in particular, because a lot of people are very concerned about the possibility that the process involved in fracking contaminates groundwater. That seems to be the number one concern, and there are some additional concerns people have raised about possible impact on seismic activity. There are places in Ohio and Oklahoma that have never really experienced much in the way of earthquakes that are now starting to sense some seismic activity. What are we to make of uh, the environmental concerns about fracking and what about the regulatory environment that's developing? Well, the idea of fracking has been around for a long time. I mean, it's not something new that we see. The horizontal drilling was the one that was introduced that uh, allow us to extract more gas from the ground. So uh, considering the, the, the process that caused fracturing of the layers of the ground in order to extract the gas and oil, that is of a major concern because once you fracture the layer, you allow seeping of contaminant into the groundwater and also the same thing as the gas into the uh, clean water and groundwater. And those are the major concern in terms of the contaminations, underground contaminations. Another major concern is the fresh water that's used in this process. Approximately six to eight million gallon of water is used per operations initially and if it's going to the second stage it requires much more water and those water needs to be cleaned up once it's uh, 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 contaminated and then the the amount of we are right now in a dry dry out season and the process of cleaning the water the process of what we're going to do with those water that is contaminated that's used in the process that's also a major issue and Jalal, and when we talk about the regulatory environment, there are a couple of states, I believe it's New York and Vermont, that have, uh, have actually placed outright bans on fracking. It's debatable as to how much fracking they would have done in Vermont anyway, but nonetheless, they have banned it. Uh, other states are considering temporary moratoriums and so forth. 
here in California, a lot of conversation about that. Uh, let's talk about the technology, the fact that it has improved so much in the last 10 years to give us this access to uh, what was previously thought of as unreachable resources. Will the technology be able to keep up with the regulatory environment and vice versa? As was mentioned, uh, fracking or hydraulic fracturing has been around for years. Uh, the, the way uh, it's now used to uh, exploit uh, unconventional resources and what, what, what I mean is the shale gas, sh shale oil, uh, those areas depending on the ge geographic locations, depths of the reservoir, uh, the uh, nature of the formation that uh, hydraulic fracturing is done on it uh, makes a big difference. So it varies from uh, state to state. Uh, offshore versus onshore, and uh, th there are a lot of uh, uh, tech uh, new technologies as well as uh, procedures that are in place and uh, constantly improving to minimize the damages to the environment from water to the soil to uh, as well as uh, to the air, you know, the surrounding uh, areas. Uh, so uh, many uh, energy companies these days uh, have uh, put uh, restrictions on uh, use of uh, chemicals that are uh, uh, known to be uh, toxic and so they are changing the, the chemistry of the materials that are used in uh, hydraulic fracturing is improving has imp improved significantly in the past uh, decade or so and uh, so depending on the states I, I understand that certain uh, areas uh, are more prone to the side effects of the fracturing but uh, there, uh, if the depths of the reservoir is so uh, deep, it, it's, the, the effect is minimum. And when we talk about oil drilling and fracturing and all of those technologies, we're, we're also talking about extracting or bringing up natural gas as well, because it, they really come together. And natural gas uh, has experienced a tremendous boom as well. It's used for manufacturing in terms of powering plants and with petrochemical processing. And we can also liquefy it, and once we liquefy it, we compress it significantly. It's about one six hundredth of its vapor um, volume when you uh, liquefy it, and then we can transport it in cryogenic vessels and keep it very cold. Uh, what's the future for natural gas? And they call it the, the cleanest fossil fuel. Why is that so? Well, if you look at natural gas, uh, the emission of the natural gas has much lower carbon footprint, which has much lower particulates, much lower NOx, which is the source of the uh, smog that we have and other diseases, uh, pulmonary diseases that we have. Um, so uh, from that point of view, natural gas is preferred. The, the push toward the changing the engines to the compressed natural gas or LNG engines that can be used um, is, is a major, ha will have a major impact in, in terms of a carbon footprint. Transportation contributes significantly to carbon footprint. So if we can change the carbon footprint of transportations through natural gas, so obviously there would be a boom for natural gas because we consume natural gas instead of the oil. At the same time, we reduce the emissions, which is the major concern in our area. And Jalal, we use petroleum products for more than just uh, powering our vehicles. We use petroleum in manufacturing. In fact, almost every product you can think of has some petroleum component in it. Talk about that a little bit, and if this resource is valuable for manufacturing, why are we burning it? That's a very good point. You know, uh, we should consider uh, oil as a very uh, scarce resource that's used uh, for many applications, start from uh, medicine to all our daily uh, uh, uses for uh, various things, whatever we see here are basically made somehow uh, partially from uh, oil and uh, petroleum, basically. So I, I think uh, we need to uh, move uh, the use of, uh, from using um, petroleum only for transportation and cause, uh, mainly for transportation and, and uh, using it for uh, better applications uh, in all manufacturing areas. Uh, the, 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 uh, as long as we are dependent on uh, cars that are run by 
gasoline, unfortunately, uh, this, the main uh, use for petroleum would be in that section, and the transportation. And with the advances in uh, alternative uh, fuels, I think we are getting less dependent on that. The, uh, although we need to consider that uh, other alternative vehicles that are used, for example, electric cars, uh, they have to be charged and they have to use the batteries and uh, they also use partially natural gas or oil in order to produce the power that's needed. So uh, as uh, mentioned, natural gas is going to play a, an important role in uh, moving uh, uh, from uh, use of oil in transportation to other areas and also power generation, uh, which is needed for all manufacturing purposes. Okay, and since we're talking about transportation, yeah. let's talk about Tesla and their recent decision to move their plant to Nevada, mm -hmm. as opposed to placing that battery plant here in California. That plant is uh, worth $5 billion in terms of development and uh, creating batteries that are supposed to be more efficient and cheaper and mass produced so that the electric car market can take off. Um, Hamid, why did they go to Nevada? Why not stay here in a very green state if they're a green company? Well, one of the major things was that California required them that I, I think up to 60% of the power come from renewable source. Right now, renewable source are more expensive than power generated from the petroleum products or natural gas or other things. So they didn't want to bear the cost. And I think California made a right decision to propose that. And the reason is that California is leader in terms of air, con air pollution, reducing air, air, air pollution and air quality. They are the leader. And they have a goal and they have certain policy to reach that goal. In order to get that goal, they, they have to attain that certain level of carbon footprint. And allowing uh, the company to, to to go without renewable energy was a mistake because it would be very difficult to reach that without, uh, without this could be very difficult to reach that kind of level of carbon footprint that we are looking for maintaining good air quality. And with that, we're going to have to take a break. When we come back after the break, we'll be talking about renewable, sustainable energy sources that don't involve mining, extracting, or burning. Stay with us. We have a job to do out here today. To be a winning team, you have to work like a winning team. My team depends on me. And my team is 50,000 strong. Looks like a lot of work's going into this. This is what it feels like to be part of a team. A winning team. The action team. Are we ready? Action team. Get in on the action at actionteam.org. Are you in? Welcome back to Talking Points. I'm Dave Kelly. My guests today are Dr. Jalal Tarabzadeh and Dr. Hamid Rahai. We're talking about oil and alternative energy. And before I left, uh, we, I promised the viewers that we would leave the subject of mining and extracting and burning. But before we do that, one last chance, one more bite at the apple, as they say. Uh, Jalal, what about this concept of horizontal drilling? and the ability to get down deep into those reservoirs, how has that changed? Uh, I, I think uh, the technology is based on how to reach uh, the oil that has not been tapped. Uh, when we talk about oil and gas reservoirs, uh, there are oil and gas inside the pore spaces of the rocks. Uh, it's not like a pool of oil and gas that we find it. So the oil and gas will flow through the porous channels that are generated inside the porous space, and there should be a force to bring it from one place to another, to move it. Uh, when uh, the natural energy of the reservoir uh, is depleted, there is not enough force or pressure on, on, on the ground, and they have to uh, make the movement of these uh, fluids easier by creating channels. Uh, and that, those channels is when you uh, uh, dr uh, drill the well in a direction that reaches uh, or tap more oil and gas. And the technology that has been developed resulted in a significant increase the, in the overall recovery factor. We, uh, before the horizontal drilling mo from most oil reservoirs, 
we could uh, recover only 25% or up to that. With this, we can go even to 75% depending on the locations. So there, there are uh, technologies that can uh, reach oil and gas that are untapped in the reservoir uh, depending on the location, depths, and uh, it's improving significantly. Hydraulic fracturing, which we talked about, is just to create a channel to let the, the oil and gas move in the direction of the well bore to be produced. Uh, so uh, uh, there, uh, in, in terms of the uh, uh, use of the technology, it helps also the environment. So it minimizes the number of wells that are drilled. So you can go in any direction that you, you want to tap the unrecovered uh, oil. And so I think the message here is that technology is evolving on all fronts. Yeah. It's evolved in terms of oil extraction, as you just mentioned, mm -hmm. but it's also evolving in a number of other ways as well. Hamid, tell us about solar. What, where, what can we look forward to with solar power? Well, um, solar power has been around for a long time. I mean, since 70s, if you remember the old crisis of 70s, uh, there was a mandate by the Congress to, to go more towards renewable and solar became very popular. Later on, because of the cheap oil, then they got away from it, and then now we're going back to this. Uh, the investment in solar has increased significantly, and the efficiency of the solar panels has gone up. There are some more research is done in terms of the developing a kind of flexible solar panels and liquid type solar panels. So we can increase the motion of electric electrons so we can improve the electricity and the efficiency of the solar panels. But then adjacent to that, we have other technologies that are developing. And if I might go over this, the reason is this, that for solar, if we stay around the efficiency of 20% or 25%, we still need a large area to be able to produce enough power for the cities and communities and so on. So that is the hindrance to the problem because if we either we go microgrid and use solar panels on every roof and make every home as an independent power plant or segments of a power plant and so on, and that's costly. And unless we have large surface area, if you have a large surface area, then the costs go down and it, it is beneficial to have solar. And the problem, another problem with solar is it won't work in areas that have a lot of overcast, cloudy days, uh, particularly in the wintertime. Um, areas such as northern Ohio or northern Michigan and places in the Midwest, it's not very practical. Here in Southern California, certainly in Nevada and the Southwest, we can make good use of solar year round. So if you can't use solar, another alternative is wind. I see a lot of windmills in the Midwest when I fly over, yes. and uh, they dot the landscape uh, you know, pretty massively there these days. What are we looking at in terms of wind power and its capacity? Well, there was a study done in 2000 at Stanford that it says that if you go to about 80 meters or about 240 feet elevations, which is equivalent to the height of a 1500 kilowatt uh, wind turbines, uh, then you have enough wind that to supply electricity of the whole world. That's, that's, but not all locations have this level. Some have more, some have less. So depending on how we can evaluate the locations of these and the energy potential of the wind, then we can tap into this. You mentioned other parts of the country. In, in Southern California, we don't have that much wind except certain locations uh, within the California where you see those solar, uh, where you see those wind turbines. But uh, it's a mixture. It's a mixture that based on energy potential of the location. At one location, you may have a lot of winds that you can tap into this. And another location like California, we have a lot of solar. Uh, power that we can tap into this. So it's a mixture. And uh, Jalal, we, we can also talk about hydroelectric power. We know that Hoover Dam has been generating hydroelectric power for many years. Lake Mead's in trouble though because of the drought we've had for several years. So every application has some area of need. And in the case of Hoover Dam, it's water. Exactly, and the, the less uh, water resources that we have, we, we are not going to have enough uh, power generated from hydroelectric. But uh, the alternative that uh, are working is the wave. 
energy uh, in, in the ocean. And that's coming into consideration. Many European countries are already using that as an alternative to uh, building a dam and using the uh, natural energy that's stored in the ocean. But again, depending on the location, visibility of uh, the economic consideration uh, and uh, the uh, need uh, for the type of the energy, for example, electricity versus other, uh, th these are under consideration, but uh, uh, we are at the beginning of that stage. In terms of the wind, uh, excuse me, the uh, ocean tides that you mentioned, uh, uh, the ocean has a tremendous amount of force and power, and they've been trying to, to harness that power one of the problems is that it is so powerful that the technologies that they have have to be very, very uh, rigorous to withstand that kind of uh, daily impact. Uh, Hamid, tell us about this. What can they do? Well, you know, the same way that we have been using wind turbines um, uh, on the, you know, above the earth, that kind of technology has been used underground. So optimization of a system that can sustain the, the, the force of the ocean, that it can extract the energy from that, that has been a challenge the same way that developing a system that we can harness the wind uh, above the surface of the air. So with advanced technology in terms of materials and um, in terms of structures, we should be able to make headway in this, in this area. And hopefully in the near future we have uh, technologies that we can generate. Another problem uh, that we have with this technology is transmission. If you go far away from the land, how do you transmit? And transmission is a major challenge because the same way that the ocean force impacts the technology of generating electricity, it also affects the cables and all the way that we need to transmit this energy to the land for usage. Let's talk about the grid. Everyone talks about the grid these days. Uh, it has vulnerabilities. Uh, it could be vulnerable to a terrorist attack. It could even be vulnerable to a solar flare event. Uh, the coronal mass ejection uh, concept of uh, massive solar flares. Uh, so we're, there is some vulnerability there. And so people are now talking about microgrids, which are much, much smaller independent units that are connected to the grid but can separate from it in the event of an emergency. Uh, what about the microgrids? What are we doing along uh, those lines in terms of development, both for providing power at the local level and also providing a sense of security from the overall grid collapsing? Well, we have to look at the two technologies that are being implemented right now. The solar is the primary technologies that are pushed, and the wind is the secondary technology. For the solar, we know for every 100 square footage, we get one kilowatt. And if we have five hours, we have five kilowatt hour of this. In order to produce uh, enough electricity for a home of about 20 kilowatt hour, we need about 400 square footage of land that can face the south, and then we can generate electricity. So, and then the cost become a major issue. If we go with a small scale system, the cost is much higher than larger system. So the, the approach has been to identify large roofs uh, of the industrial compounds, industrial areas, to be able to bring the cost down, at the same time generate enough electricity that can feed to the grid and also secure the electricity for the local community. So that has been the primary, and then the secondary was that to, to go to the roof of the houses, and then once the costs come down, then we can make every house a power plant, a kind of standard power plant that can feed itself and also feed the extra to the grid. So that has been the approach from the solar point of view. For, from the wind point of view, if you look at the aerodynamics of the cities, which call, we call them urban aerodynamics, urban aerodynamics generate winds at different locations. While we see that sometimes dead areas, then sometimes we see that the wind tunnel areas, depending on the configuration of the buildings, that there are enough uh, wind generated that if we can tap into that, we can generate electricity. And with that comes the technology, the new technology, that we have vertical axis wind turbines, that we have 
uh, high efficiency, they have high efficiency, and those vertical axis wind turbines are the one that can be used, just like a pole, um, electric poles, and that, uh, first of all, they, they can be ad adjacent to the building within the city, they are not disrupting anything, they can be part of the urban um, complexity, at the same time, they can generate electricity. And those are becoming very attractive also as part of the microgrid. Okay, we've only got about a minute left uh, in about uh, 20 seconds or less. Uh, Jalal, what about nuclear power? Uh, nuclear in this country has a different view than uh, the rest of the world. Uh, many, even oil producing countries are going in that direction while uh, Europeans are uh, minimizing. So, so there are certain countries that are totally dependent on uh, nuclear because of uh, lack of resources, uh, other resources. I, I, I think if nuclear is used, uh, regulated well and planned and designed well, uh, it, it plays a big role uh, in terms of uh, the needs. The need for uh, energy is going to increase, and all these uh, resources that we are uh, talking about are um, expensive, uh, and uh, the era of cheap oil is gone. Uh, the, uh, so alternative energy, any, any of them, would play a major role. So uh, depending on the uh, environmental regulations and the public knowledge. Um, and uh, regarding uh, energy, as was mentioned, uh, the transportation, storage, those are the things that needs to be considered when we are planning on any uh, type of uh, energy sources. Well, I want to thank you both for joining us today. I've learned a lot in this session, and I'm sure our viewers have as well. And thank you for joining us. Join us again for another episode of Talking Points in the near future. Until then, I'm Dave Kelly. Have a nice day.